Rav Cook Selected Letters Translated and Annotated by Tzvi Feldman Chapter 2 Subject is Torah versus Other Religions and Philosophies A quote from Mamare Haraya, page 41 As long as the tumult of those who deny faith is engaged in a moral direction, it is indeed a search for God. A preface to chapter to letter 5 Freedom of thought is an important principle, states Rav Cook. But in the case of Judaism, where the existence of the nation is dependent on a particular idea, the nation must not allow deviation from that idea. He also distinguishes between atheism, which he sees as a great crime, and the more common affliction of our time, agnosticism. Letter number 5 from the holy city of Jaffa may be built an established 10th of Sivan 5665, 13th of June 1905, to Rav Seidel. In, re- in reference to my words in the open letter, this is letter 26, where I stated that I do not seek to control anyone's opinion, you asked whether this is out of necessity or also the law of the Torah. Indeed, in my language there is no ambiguity, since I stated, because in our time it is not acceptable. So it follows that we learn from this that such a requirement had its place. The issue, however, requires great mountains of study to clarify its boundaries, and since it is impossible for me to write at length, I will write briefly and hope it will suffice for someone as discerning as you. You should know that common sense is always a very important principle in law, be it applied law, halakha, or legal theory. We therefore always have to reach the core of the truth, and when we see a truth contradicting another truth, there then must be a determining factor, and this will be the place for new study. Thus we will see how far the limits of freedom of opinion, considered a basic truth by most enlightened men in the world today, extend according to reason. Perhaps you say it has no bounds. That, however, cannot be said. For one, because we do not have even one virtue in the world which extremism will not harm. Furthermore, the nature of the matter requires that there be a limit to freedom of thought, for if there is no such limit, every person would cast away all obligations of accepted morality until he reaches in his own mind an understanding of what he stands for, and then the earth would be filled with corruption. A total separation between opinions and deeds is impossible, because actions to a small or large extent necessarily stem from opinions. For instance, For a person to accept at heart that there is no wrong in murder is definitely a sin. For if this acceptance flourishes, the existence of the world would be destroyed, and the same is true for other examples. Thus we learn there is a limit to freedom of opinion, but the difficult issue is to determine this limit. It follows that the limit is not identical in every society. For example, the full acceptance at heart that there is no harm in walking nude in the streets for he who believes in it and calls for people to actually behave in this manner is a sin in our society and deservedly so. But this would not be a sin, a sin among the savages on the island of New Guinea, for example. As there are necessarily differences between societies, the differences are not static, but rather continue to differentiate in accordance with a multitude of conditions. With regard to religion, there is a marked distinction in this matter between Israel and the rest of the world. Were there a nation in the world whose main being and continued existence as a nation were dependent on a particular idea, then it would be completely legitimate and even obligatory that with regard to that idea there be no freedom of thought within that nation. For this is not freedom, but laziness of the nation to defend itself because of the nervous tendency of a few people. Uh, footnote, Rav Cook may be referring to cowardly acts of leaders motivated by the fear of not looking sufficiently progressive. Back to the text. It is true that sometimes individuals should rebel against their nation when they find that the idea that unites and sustains their nation is harmful to mankind, in which case they must renounce their nation for the truth. If, however, the idea which strengthens a nation is in no way harmful, and all the more so if the idea is both beneficial outside its borders and essential for the nation's own existence, then there is no room for tolerance, and someone who is tolerant in this matter deserves the contempt of the whole nation and all mankind. There is no other nation in the whole in the world whose acknowledgement of the name of God, blessed be he, as the Lord of the universe, keeper of the covenant, loving kindness, and always of righteousness, which are attributes of the Holy One, blessed be he, is the basis of its national life, 
and a unique condition of its restoration to its land and the establishment of its rule uh, of its rule Israel of its rule sorry in the establishment of its rule Israel's conditions are such that it cannot exist without these exalted ideas all greatness of soul is associated with a parallel deficiency see letter 6 and Israel certainly has those deficiencies as well which lead it to the necessity of the virtue of bearing God's name as its common identity therefore whoever undermines through thought and all the more so through deed the idea which vitalizes the nation is a traitor to the nation and his pardon is folly there is no other example of this in the entire world there is no other nation or people in the world whose national character is connected in the nature of its being with the knowledge of God is in its midst and in the and in the world nor with the tenets of any other faith even if there is an exceptional nation which has a base faith and its faith is national that faith is surely so small that its very expansion will bring harm to all of mankind furthermore such a nation cannot possibly survive because this nation's destruction is imminent and its individuals cannot be required to, to fulfill the duties obligatory to its existence. This is the basis of true zeal of God, the possessors of which are worthy to be given the everlasting priestly covenant, in contrast with a hasty zeal which stems from lack of wisdom and weak character. In order for us to realize national sovereignty, it is necessary that the spiritual powers of the nation reach complete perfection. Footnote. The rebuilding of Israel, all Jews living in the land of Israel, living ordered lives, temple, kingship, priesthood, prophecy, judges and officers. See Orat HaTorah Yeshivat Merkaz Harav 5733 page 8. But in the me- uh, back to the text. But in the meantime, to avoid national rule totally is also impossible, because the spiritual character of the nation is, blessed be God, always alive. David, king of Israel, is alive and enduring. This is from Rosh Hashanah 25a. Hence this is the counsel of the Lord, who is wonderful in counsel and great in wisdom, that the nation's capacity to control opinion diminishes to the same extent that the nation's spiritual powers weaken and that this inability to control opinion is a sign of God's will. There are many ways to do this. Sometimes it is a practical obstacle, such as the fear of the state and so forth. Sometimes it is a spiritual obstacle, such as the obligation not to say things which are unacceptable. See uh, Yabamot 65b. We accept, so, we accept ob- obstacles such as these gladly because we recognize that it is divine providence in our times and this is why we find in the Jerusalem Talmud that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai was glad that the power to enforce the laws was removed in his time from Israel because we are not wise enough to judge this is uh, from Jerusalem Talmud Sanhedrin 7b that is what is, in, that, that is, what is pertinent to understanding my words. As for the law, you should know that even though it is utterly prohibited and diseased for one to doubt and wonder about matters of perfect faith, we do not find sages applying the law of heresy in such a case, in such a case but only in the case of an unbeliever that is, one who definitely affirms the opposite. And absolute belief in the opposite can be found in Israel only amongst those who are inherently wicked and deliberate liars because even the greatest evil influence can only cast doubt in weak-minded persons. Footnote, people who seek external validation for faith. Back to the text. Therefore, someone who dares to say that he is unequivocally an atheist is completely wicked and is fit to be judged accordingly to all the explicit laws, since there is no justification to the argument that he was compelled to think thusly. And if the atheistic idea in our generation were genuine, it would always claim uncertainty, and its doubts could easily be clarified. But it lies deliberately and claims certainly at a time when even the most weak-minded are at most doubtful, are at most doubtful of the existence of God. The atheistic idea is in brazen pursuit of malice, and is thus liable to all the laws in the hands of man and heaven, in accordance with the harm it does. Clarification of the details of this law would, of course, require many lengthy books. This is clear, 
that whoever reaches the understanding that the understanding that any denial of faith in relation to Judaism is nothing but a feeble argument, feeble argument of doubt, a combination of a lack of, ac- of actual knowledge, a lack of feeling, and a shortcoming in virtue, virtue, will immediately become totally true to his faith and God-fearing. And the more he attaches, attaches himself to Torah scholars, true seekers of God, the more he will be exalted and filled with an unmovable faith of wisdom and knowledge. No weapon formed against you shall succeed, and every tongue that rises against you at law you shall condemn. Such is the lot of the servants of the Lord. Such their triumph through me, declares the Lord. From Ishayahu 54.17 Humbly yours, Avraham Yitzchak Hakohen Cook, Igrot 20.